today is how uh, David and Solomon help us can help us prepare for the coming of Christ. We want to prepare our hearts to the goal for the coming of Christ at Christmas. And uh, I want to try to look at how we prepare ourselves for Christ's coming from the perspective of God's word, you know, not just thinking about the presence that we need to get, or not just thinking uh, about all the practical details. Um, but kind of going into how does God's word see Christ's coming? And one of the most uh, important ways uh, uh, that the God's word sees Christ's coming is a, as a fulfillment of what was promised in David and in Solomon. And as an example of that, I'd like to begin um, with the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1. I've uh, I've heard that all of you have your Bibles with you. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open it up. Uh, we're going to be in Luke chapter 1, uh, verses starting in verse 26. And this is the Annunciation uh, that the angel Gabriel makes to the Virgin Mary. And it says the following. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Hail, full of grace, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, and considered in her mind what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever and ever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. So this is how the angel, when he appears to the Blessed Virgin Mary, shares this message of joy of the coming of the Christ, of the Messiah. And notice all the emphasis here on David, right? Joseph who is of the house of David. And then the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob, this kingdom that will have no end. This reading uh, is actually the gospel from the liturgy on December 20th, just a few days before Christmas. And it's part of the preparation, of course. It's the most important moment of preparation that Mary had. And we can imagine how she would meditate on these words in her heart. And on Christmas, uh, on Christmas at the Midnight Mass, there is a reading that I also want to share with you just to show how important this idea is in the scriptures. And that's from the, the prophet Isaiah. If you open up the prophet Isaiah uh, chapter 9, we'll only read two verses here, but this is one of the most famous passages uh, that speaks about the coming of the Messiah. So chapter 9 of the prophet Isaiah, verses 6 and 7, says, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness. From this time forth and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So here we have this amazing prophecy of a child that will be born, who is going to be wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, and who will sit over the throne of David forever. And this is the reading that the church proposes for us on at Midnight Mass uh, for Christmas. So we see the importance of that the scriptures give to the throne of David and this kingdom that David uh, made, uh, established for the coming of the Messiah. So I want to focus here on how uh, David and Solomon prefigure the Messiah who comes. Um, First of all, what is typology? 
Um, and I want to share with you a, a definition. This is from uh, my book, Fulfilling Christ the Sacraments, which is about typology and symbols of the sacraments. But this definition applies for, uh, for any sort of prefiguration. And the definition is typology is the discernment of realities, events, deeds, words, symbols, or signs in the Bible that foreshadow the fulfillment of God's plan in Jesus Christ. And if you want to study this in the catechism, there's two important sections. One is uh, the numbers 128 to 130. And then as well, later on, uh, around the number 1094, where it speaks about uh, this, the, the definition draws from these two numbers, especially. And the first section, especially 128 to 130, uh, describes how the, the church understands typology. So let's try to break this uh, definition down a little bit. If you want to go to the next uh, slide there. I mentioned I wouldn't speak about uh, sacramental typology, but I'm going to give one example because it's uh, one of the more famous examples of typology. And that is that in the scriptures, the crossing of the Red Sea that Moses led the people of Israel out of uh, out of Egypt into the promised land, crossing through the Red Sea, and Pharaoh and his army are drowned in the Red Sea is presented by St. Paul as a prefiguration or a type of Christian baptism. St. Paul in his letter to the Corinthians says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. So here St. Paul says that the crossing of the Red Sea was a prefiguration, uh, was something that was, it was an example for us, something that was given uh, as something to prepare us for uh, baptism. He says that they were baptized into Moses. Uh, so next, next slide. And he's, he's uh, mentioning this as a prefiguration of our baptism into Christ, of course. So we can say that as God freed his people from slavery in Egypt through the crossing of the Red Sea, so he frees Christians from the slavery to sin through the waters of baptism would be the general uh, meaning of this prefiguration. That we have this event in the Old Testament of the crossing of the Red Sea, and it prefigures, points forward to our freedom from sin through baptism. So next slide. Uh, in this slide, I have three features of biblical typology that are always very important and uh, that when you're looking at a biblical type, you should try to ask yourself about what, how do these uh, features, uh, how do we find these features? And this definition of these features of typology comes from Joseph Ratzinger, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. He suggests that in typology, we have always three elements. There will always be a fundamental continuity, first element, second element, a radical discontinuity, and third element, a transcendent transcendence and completion. So let's take a look at each one of these elements one by one. So the next slide. Um, the first element is a fundamental continuity. And in this example of the crossing of the Red Sea, there are uh, elements that are absolutely central to this uh, to this moment in salvation history, which are present in both the crossing of the Red Sea and in Christian baptism. So, for example, we have a freeing from slavery in both cases, right? Um, we have a passing through water that destroys, at the same time, the one who is enslaving the other, right? Uh, Pharaoh and his army or Satan and, and sin. And in both cases, this is a passing um, that leads to the promised land. Okay, so there's a fundamental continuity that is not, not any sort of uh, comparison works. Uh, there might be elements that are the same in one, in one passage and another, but that's not enough. That the elements that are central to the passage and central to the meaning of the passage should be in fundamental continuity. So next slide. The second uh, element that is always present is a radical discontinuity. And here we see this in uh, in this case as well. 
in the case of the crossing of the Red Sea, there was a physical freedom that's being uh, granted. And that's not the same as in, in baptism. You're not being freed from physical slavery in baptism. Instead, you're, uh, you're give, being given a spiritual freedom. And those are not the same thing. There's a discontinuity. There's also in the Old Testament, in the crossing of the Red Sea, you have a victory over Pharaoh and his army. Uh, but in baptism, we have a victory over Satan and sin. And finally, it's uh, not the promised land, a physical area of planet Earth that is being offered to uh, as a, a goal of this crossing, but it's heaven. And these are not the same thing. There's a radical discontinuity. And these are also this is also a fundamental part of what it means to for there to be a, a type, a prefiguration. And the reason that this is fundamental to typology is we can understand when we look at the third characteristic or feature of biblical typology, if you can move to the next slide, and that is transcendence and completion. So spiritual freedom is different than physical freedom. There's similarities between them, but spiritual freedom is much greater than physical freedom. If we have to ever have to choose in our lives between being a slave physically, uh, but still being spiritually free, or being a spiritual slave and being um, somehow enslaved to others. We should always prefer spiritual freedom. It is so much more important. It is so much greater. So this physical freedom that the Israelites are being granted is something that points forward to something that is much greater that is granted in baptism. And the same thing could be said for the other elements here. A victory over Satan and sin is something that is much greater than a victory over Pharaoh and his army, even though there are lots of similarities. And heaven is something that is much greater than the promised land. So these are the three elements, next slide, of biblical typology. These elements are always present. And the reason that we have these is that uh, God in his plan of salvation is preparing the way for what he is going to give us in Christ, the fullness that he is going to give us in Christ. And so there are going to be similarities, but the differences are actually going to be even greater because what Christ brings is so much greater than any of these preparations. That's why some of the church fathers and the letters to Hebrews and so on speaks of them as a shadow, right? They are a preparation that is almost like a shadow to the reality. And this is not to deny the importance of the Old Testament events or their meaning in and of themselves, right? The crossing of the Red Sea had a meaning in and of itself apart from Christian baptism, but it also at the same time points forward to uh, Christian baptism. Uh, so uh, thank you, Anna. You can close the, the PowerPoint now. Uh, and now we're going to apply this to David and Solomon. So we want to be looking for these elements of continuity, discontinuity, and fullness or com transcendence completion as regards David and Solomon. How did they prepare us for the coming of uh, baby Jesus at Christmas? So what I'd like to do is I'd like to share with you um, first for David and then next for Solomon, three different ways for each of them that they prefigure Jesus Christ and that we see alluded to explicitly in the New Testament in, in each of these cases, both for uh, David and for Solomon. So let's start with David. And we can go back to that passage that we started with um, for in Luke, Luke chapter one. And the first element here is very, uh, very simple. And that is that David prefigures Christ because David was a king over a nation. And this is uh, what is mentioned here in chapter 1, verse 32 of the Gospel of Luke. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. So Jesus here is a king, and he is going to be a king. Uh, he's ruling over, in this case, a nation. And so we can ask ourselves, um, how does this prefigure Jesus, right? So one of the messages that uh, the liturgy wants to give to us, that the word of God wants to give to us about how we should approach Christmas is to look at how Jesus is a king. Uh, 
we're not just holding in, in our arms uh, spiritually a, a, a little baby. We are doing that. But we are also holding in our arms uh, the king of kings who is reigning and who is ruling. And as a ruler, he is someone uh, who has authority over us. Right? Um, so this is the first way. We can also see this uh, alluded to in a way that points out the continuity, discontinuity, and completion aspect in the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. In uh, chapter 2, beginning in verse 22. And this is the discourse that uh, that St. Peter does, gives, on the day of Pentecost, when they receive the Holy Spirit. And he says, men of Israel, verse 22 Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 22. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God, with mighty works and wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst. As you yourself know, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. But God raised him up, having loosed the pangs of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover, my flesh will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades, nor let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brethren, I may say to you confidently of the patriarch David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with him an oath that he would set one of his descendants upon his throne, he foresaw and spoke of the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. So notice how all the elements here of typology, of prefiguration, are present. It speaks about God's plan of salvation uh, that at the beginning. And then how uh, you have someone who is going to sit upon the Davidic throne or who sits upon the Davidic throne, right? Jesus, and who is like David, right? David speaks in a sort of symbolic way about how God will not let his flesh see corruption when he is saved from death, right? He's want, they want to kill uh, David and David is saved and from this moment, from this threat. And he gives thanks to God for that. So there's this similarity, right? David is saved from death. Jesus is saved from death. But Jesus' salvation is so much greater when he is risen from the dead in a way that is far more transcendent uh, that, than David ever was. So all of these elements here, again, related to David being a king and Jesus now being a king, but in such a, uh, a fuller sense now, as well, integrating the resurrection. So that's the first element of Davidic uh, prefiguration of Jesus. The second that I'd like to share with you that comes up in the New Testament is that David is uh, a priestly king. He's not just a king, but he is a priestly king. And to um, introduce this topic, I would like to take um, the passage of, uh, begin with the passage of Matthew 12. So open with me to Matthew chapter 12. And we'll begin at, at verse 1. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read? Um, have you not read what David did when he was hungry and those that were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which it was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So 
Jesus points out here when the Pharisees critique him, how, um, how he is imitating what David did. And David did something that was reserved only to the priests. And uh, what he's referring to is uh, 1 Samuel chapter 21. If you want to read the passage later, we won't, we won't have time to go in right now. When David arrives, he is um, being persecuted by Saul, but he arrives and he is with his men and they eat the bread of the presence in, uh, at the, uh, the sanctuary there. And um, the bread of the presence was meant to be only for the priests. Leviticus chapter 24, verse 9 describes this, how the bread of the presence was only for the priests. And why was David then able to eat it? Well, the reason is because even though he wasn't king yet, he had already been anointed uh, by the prophet uh, Samuel as a future king. And the, when he receives the anointing, it says that the Holy Spirit comes down upon him. And so he's already anointed as a king, but he's not only anointed as a king. He is also in a certain sense anointed as a priest. And uh, this is alluded to in this, that he's able to eat of the, the bread of the presence. But why? What type of priest is he? Because he's not a Levitical priest. He's not an, uh, a priest of Aaron. Uh, to answer that question, we need to go to the letter to the Hebrews, uh, chapter 5. So open with me to Hebrews chapter 5. And we're going to just take a look here. Uh, it, here, the letter to the Hebrews, the author is speaking about Jesus as the high priest. And we'll begin here in verse chapter 5, verse 5. So also, Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, You are a priest forever, in the order of Melchizedek. Now, this passage here that speaks about the priest in the order of Melchizedek is actually taken from the Psalms. And now if we go to uh, the book of Psalms, go ahead and oh, go to Psalm 110, we'll be able to understand a little bit better what is going on here with King David and why he is able to eat uh, the, this, the bread of the presence. Uh, so it's either Psalm 110. For some of your Bibles, it might be Psalm 109. The numbers can change, but most Bibles will have Psalm 110. And I'll just begin here in verse 1. Notice, however, in the title of your psalm, and this is important for this, that it says, uh, your psalm will say that it's a psalm of David. So each one of the psalms has uh, listed above it, or most of the psalms have listed above it, who the author is attributed to. And in this case, it is a Psalm of David. So this is David speaking here, David writing this Psalm. And it says, the Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. You'll remember that Jesus quotes this Psalm, speaking about how David said this. And how could David say this? Because he was referring to someone who's greater than him, right? And Jesus says, I am that greater, uh, great, that greater one. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter, rule in the midst of your foes. Yours is dominion on the day you lead your host in holy splendor. From the womb of the morning I begot you. The Lord has sw sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now this is a psalm that describes the swearing-in ceremony or the anointing ceremony of the king. This is David writing about this moment. Uh, and he says that he, at that moment, becomes a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. So David is a priest. He's not a Levitical priest. He's not an Aaronic priest, but he is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And this allows him to act in certain priestly ways that are different from the uh, priests, the Aaronic priests, but, or the Levitical priests, but that is a real priesthood nonetheless. And notice that this is the priesthood that the letter to the Hebrews says that Jesus had. Jesus is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And so David is not only a king, but he is a kingly priest, just like uh, Jesus is. Uh, 
And we see uh, David acting in this way uh, throughout his life. If you remember um, when he brings the, the Ark of the Covenant up to Jerusalem, he dresses up in a priestly garb. It says that he wears uh, in 1 Chronicles 15, it says that David wore a linen ephod. And this linen ephod, it was something that was reserved only to the priest. And every time that it appears in the Bible, it is referred to, in, it is described as a priestly garment. In Exodus chapter 28, the garments of the priests are described, and it says that it's a, and the, the ephod was a priestly garment, and it says that it was made of linen. And then in the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel 22 as well, at one point, the priests are simply referred to as persons who wore the linen ephod. That was what defined them as people. It was in, you can see that in 1 Samuel 22, 18, if you want to look that up uh, later. Uh, but by putting on a linen ephod in this way, David is identifying himself as a priest. And he can do that because he is a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Now, David, of course, also wanted to found a temple. He wasn't able to do that. But he has this, uh, this priestly character about him. And that is the second way that he prefigures Jesus. So when Jesus comes at uh, Christmas, he is not only a priest who rules over us, but, uh, or not only a king who rules over us, but he is also a priest who ministers to us, uh, who gives us forgiveness, who intercedes for us. Uh, and we'll talk about other ways as well here uh, later on in the talk. Now, the third way that David prefigures Jesus who comes at Christmas is that David was described as a man after God's own heart. And we can see this in uh, Acts of the Apostles. Turn to Acts of the Apostles, chapter 13. Uh, verses uh, 22 to 23. So Acts of the Apostles 13, 22 to 23. And when he had removed him, he raised up David to be their king when he had removed Saul, right? He raised up David, God raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will do all my will. Of this man's posterity, God has brought to Israel a savior, Jesus, as he promised. So um, this is Paul here speaking, and he is in the synagogue in Antioch in Pisidia. It's on his first missionary trip, and he speaks about this relationship between David and Jesus, that David was someone who was a man after God's own heart. And the original, this originally comes up in uh, in the uh, in the Bible, in 1 Samuel chapter 13, we can take a look at this here. It's in chapter 13, uh, verse 14, 1 Samuel 13, 14. And this is the one of the moments uh, or that where Saul is losing the favor of God. So Saul was someone who was not a man after God's heart, and he continuously disobeyed God in little and in big ways. Um, and uh, this is one of these moments here where um, he is being told that he is not going to be able to continue as king. And so chapter 13, verses, uh, verse 14. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has appointed him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And Samuel arose and went up from uh, Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin. Right? Samuel here is speaking, prophet Samuel, to Saul and communicating that uh, while his heart has not been a heart after God's heart, uh, David's is. And this is in the context of Saul disobeying the Lord, disobeying the Lord's command. And he had done so in, in big ways and in small ways, lots of in repeated ways. And God now is saying, I've had enough. Um, and this is part of what it means to be a man after God's own heart. Right? David is someone who loved God passionately, but he is also someone who obeyed God, who wanted to follow God. And of course, we know that he didn't always obey God. One of the Psalms that we have uh, is Psalm 51 that David writes after his 
a sin with Bathsheba. And he repents of his sin, of sin of adultery, his sin of murder in this case. Very, very serious sins. But he has an authentic repentance, an authentic conversion of heart. He wants to obey God. And when he fails, uh, he comes sincerely before the Lord asking for forgiveness. And the Lord is someone who is above all merciful and love. God is love, uh, St. John tells us. And so he is uh, delighted when, when we fail and come back to him. Uh, he embraces us like uh, that father who accepts back his prodigal son. And just like uh, David, we could say that the prodigal son also has a, a, a heart after God's own. This is uh, an aspect of David, right? That he is, even in spite of his failings, he's someone who sincerely loves God. And when he notices his failure, when he, uh, he comes to grip with it, he converts, he repents, and he continues to try to obey God. So now those are three aspects of David that prefigure Christ. Of course, Christ has a, a heart after God's own in a way that is much greater than David's. Um, Jesus, uh, the letter to the Hebrews speaks about this. Actually, we could go back to that and, and look at this quickly. In Hebrews chapter 10, uh, it speaks about um, how Christ fulfills uh, the Davidic heart, as it were. Um, in chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 5. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the roll of the book. So this is here the letter to the Hebrews describing Christ's attitude before God who says, even though Christ is God, he says, I have come to do your will, right? When he comes into this world, which is a Christmas moment, of course, right? Jesus coming into this world. And he comes into this world as one who wants to do God's will. And we may not have realized this, but this is citing Psalm 40. And we don't have time to look at this now, but you can look it up later if you like. It's citing Psalm 40, verses 6 to 8. And Psalm 40 is also a Psalm of David. So David here is the original one who said these words, right? That I have come to do your will. Um, and this is what made him someone after God's own heart. So those are the three ways that David uh, prefigured Christ coming into this world, right? We have him as a priest or as a king, excuse me, as a, as a priest and also now as a man after God's own heart. Let's take a look at Solomon. And we'll start out with um, the Gospel of Matthew. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 12. Uh, and we'll look at Matthew 12, verse 42. So here um, Jesus is speaking with the Pharisees and, and beginning in third, verse 38. And they ask for a sign. And Jesus says that, uh, that only an evil and adulterous generation asks for a sign. But I won't give you a sign, but I will give you the sign, he says, of Jonah, who's three days in the, the whale. And then who survives that. Um, and in that same way, I will uh, die and rise. He's sharing with us another prefiguration, another type. Jonah as a type of who he is, right? And then he, he goes on in verse 42. And this is where he mentions Solomon. He says, the queen of the south will arise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. So there's a couple different ways that we can look at this. Obviously, the theme of wisdom is here. He's this is referring to the moment in which the queen of Seba comes from the south, right? In uh, what would today be just south of Saudi Arabia up north to Israel to visit, uh, to Judah, to visit King Solomon. And she brings with her riches. Uh, they trade out. There's a lot of trade that goes on. And she's incredibly impressed with the wisdom and the wealth of Solomon, of King Solomon. But I want to focus here just for the moment on the fact that she is a, a foreign uh, queen in this case. 
because one of the things that distinguishes Solomon as a further prefiguration is that he is a king, but he's not just a king over, uh, over just Judah and Israel. He is a king also over a few other nations. And this is referred to in the Old Testament. Uh, we can look in uh, the first, uh, first book of Kings, chapter 4. Uh, verse 21. So first book of Kings chapter 4, verse 21. It says, Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates to the land of the Philistines and to the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. So while David was a king just over a single uh, nation, Solomon is a king over a, a few different nations, right? And in this way, he also prefigures Christ. We have sort of a crescendo here, an increasing uh, of the family of God that goes from a nation to a few different nations. And then, of course, it's going to be find its fullness in Jesus in all the nations. So that's the first way that Solomon prefigures Jesus. Now, with David, the second way was that he was a priest and a king. And something similar we'll, we'll see here now with Solomon. The second way that he prefigures our Lord who comes is that he is the builder of the temple. And in this way, he is also a priestly king. Um, and we see this mentioned in the Acts of the Apostles. So if we go to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7. Chapter 7 of the Acts of the Apostles is Stephen's speech. Um, he is about to be martyred, and he gives a defense. And he explains the history of salvation. And it's a history of salvation that leads up to the destruction of the temple. And to the idea of the temple not being as important as um, maybe what the contemporary Jews were thinking right now that Jesus has come. So let's just take a look here at verse um, 44. So Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7, verse 44. Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness even as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it, according to the pattern that he had seen. Our fathers, in turn, brought it in with Joshua when they dispossessed the nations which God thrust out before our fathers. So it was until the days of David, who found favor in the sight of God and asked leave to find a habitation for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made with hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne and earth my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all of these things? So um, Stephen here mentions how Solomon built a temple, but this was not a final solution. It was simply a prefiguration of what was coming right? because um, he is preparing the way for the, the, the true builder of the temple. Right, of the true temple, which will be the church and the body of Christ. Right, St. John tells us that the body of Jesus is uh, the temple. And we know as well that the body of Jesus the body, is also the church. And Jesus is the one who builds this church, as he, uh, as he mentions in Matthew 16, right? That on this rock, I will build my church. And he's referring to this uh, new temple that he is going to build. So that's the third way. Uh, the second way, excuse me, that Solomon prefigures Jesus who comes. And the third way we can take from this same verse, Matthew chapter 12, uh, verse 42, that we saw before. And it's this reference to wisdom, right? That the queen of Seba, the queen of the south, came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And if you remember from the Old Testament how Solomon, when he is a, a very young uh, man and just beginning to, to rule over uh, all of Israel, united still, uh, he prays to God and God says, ask me whatever you want and I'll give it to you. And Solomon says, I want to be wise. I, I know that I, I have so many tough decisions to make. Help me to be wise, Lord. Um, and he prays for this wisdom. Uh, and God grants that to him. And, of course, this is a prefiguration of Jesus's wisdom. Solomon, even though he was very wise, he was also someone who made a lot of uh, really bad mistakes. 
he fell into sin that led him away from his wisdom as he went through life. And Jesus, of course, is not just a wise person who persevered in his wisdom throughout his life, but he is wisdom itself who becomes incarnate. So these are the three ways that Solomon is mentioned in the New Testament as having prefigured Jesus that are related to Christmas. Right? He's a king over nations. Uh, he is the builder of the temple, and he is very wise. So let's try to wrap things up now. Um, and notice here these, um, the continuity here, but also the development, uh, the discontinuity, and, um, and then the, the transcendence completion that we have in these uh, two important historical figures, right? In all three cases, we have, um, uh, we have a ruler, right? David is a ruler over a nation. Solomon is a ruler over, um, over a few different nations. And Jesus is the king of kings. He is the ruler of all time, the ruler of the universe. Uh, he is our Lord. And this is not just something that is of relevance to those who lived a long time ago. It's also something that is relevant to me and to my life, right? That I need to make our Lord this Christmas uh, the, the Lord of my life, right? That I truly treat him as a king and I worship him as a king. The second way is all three of them are priests. We have David, who is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. We have Solomon, who continues in that priestly role, building the temple, inaugurating and anointing the temple. But then, of course, we have the high priest, the high priest of all high priests, and that is Jesus, who is an eternal king, who uh, a paternal priest who the letter to the Hebrews speaks about how he goes into the temple, not many times, but only once. And he is there eternally offering uh, up a sacrifice for us uh, and offering up prayers and intercession for us. And then finally, we have this more um, existential element, right? That what is this king like, right? It's not just uh, that he has power, but what is he like? David is a man after God's heart. Uh, someone who wants to do what God wants. Solomon is someone who is very wise. And what about Jesus? Well, Jesus not, isn't just a man after God's heart. Jesus is the sacred heart. He is God's heart, so much greater than, uh, than David's heart. Uh, Jesus is someone who never sins, right? Who is always faithful to God. Uh, and Jesus is wisdom incarnate. Uh, the wisdom of the Old Testament, which is often spoken of as something so great that it's referred to as a, a person, almost separate from God, but and yet God's wisdom, a sort of preparation for the Trinity. Well, Jesus is that wisdom incarnate. Now, I want to end uh, this talk with uh, just a mention of something that uh, of my doctorate. Anna mentioned how I'm doing a doctorate, and I'm doing it on the uh, the symbols of the church in the book of Revelation. And it's interesting because the three main symbols or um, images of the church in the book of Revelation are the city, the temple, and the bride. And these three images correspond very well with these prefigurations of David and Solomon of our Lord Jesus Christ. The city, right? A city has a king, and Jesus is the king of all kings. A temple, uh, a temple has a priest, and Jesus is the high priest. Uh, and the bride, right? This personal relationship that I, I see reflected as well in the wisdom and a man after my, uh, his own heart of David, where it's not just a cold relationship with our Lord, but it's a living and loving, uh, a, a heart that is burning on fire like the sacred heart. And that's the type of love that God wants to have with us as a bride. And these are all um, images in the in the book of Revelation that are used to speak about the people of God, about the church, which means that all of this is relevant to our own lives. This is not just um, who Jesus was, but it's also relevant to how we relate to Jesus. Jesus wants to have a personal relationship with us, where he is king of our lives, where he is uh, the priest who intercedes for us and forgives us in our lives, and where he is also um, the husband of our heart. Right? The, the spouse of our heart with a very intimate and deep personal relationship. So I hope these ideas were helpful. That's uh, the, what I wanted to share with you today. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy, happy to discuss those as well. Now. So um, first of all, Father Devin, could you talk about, um, you know, during this time of Advent, 
um, we have a lot of focus on John the Baptist. And uh, Jesus says that John the Baptist is Elijah, so, but John the Baptist denies it. So what could you just discuss that in terms of mm -hmm. what you were discussing this morning on typology? Sure. Yeah, that's an interesting question, right? Because it seems like in the New Testament, sometimes John the Baptist is called Elijah, other times he's not. Um, and as I, I think if we look at the definition that we just spoke about, about typology, it can be helpful to understand what's going on there, right? Because um, Elijah is prefiguring, um, in this case, John the Baptist, who is coming. Um, and he can also, of course, be seen as prefiguring Jesus. But in the New Testament, he's mainly uh, shown as prefiguring John the Baptist. And yet he's not John the Baptist, right? He is a, a separate historical figure who has his own meaning. And there's this continuity and discontinuity and then fullness that is found in, uh, in what comes with John the Baptist. And so I think that helps to understand what's going on here. When, when the scriptures in the New Testament speak about that he is John the Baptist, what is being affirmed is that he, um, that, that uh, John the Baptist is, is Elijah, that what is being affirmed is that Elijah was, um, or that John the Baptist is a new Elijah in the sense that he is the fullness that Elijah prefigured. And when the scriptures say that he's not, uh, what 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 he's referring to is that he's actually a different historical person, right? Um, and and that this is an essential element of typology, right? And uh, that these historical figures have their own meaning, and that meaning is valid, um, but it also points forward. And but you can look at it either way. You'll see this in scripture scholars as well. There'll be some um, scholars who exaggerated the rejection of typology because they felt that it takes away from the original meaning and value of these Old Testament figures. And when we do typology, it's important that we avoid falling into that error of suggesting that Old Testament figures are, are only shadows, as it were. They are shadows, but they're also, they have a real historical value uh, that is also part of God's plan of salvation. Father, can you, um, this is actually just following up on what Annie just asked a question I'm I, that I've been kind of pondering maybe for many years and trying to understand myself is um, is uh, how we might understand typology not simply as um, interesting similarities but um, existential continuity like that there is a, there that there's somehow um, to understand the um continuation of the life a person has lived in the fulfillment which is found in the new testament so john like we could in some like i was when you were talking this morning i was i flipped open to um one of my favorite books which is cardinal jean daniel Lou's bible in the liturgy um yeah. and he says he says the sacraments carry on in our midst the great works of God in the old and the new. For example, the flood, the passion, and baptism show us the same divine activity. And it's just something I've meditated on for a long time, but I'm not sure I've ever come. I'd like to hear your 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 understanding of that. How there's a existential continuity between events and between persons. All right. Um, so Joseph Ratzinger has lots of writings about the continuity of the people of God, and when we think about you know, who wrote the scriptures. And of course, there's endless debates about um, who, what individual authors were of for individual books. Um, but one of the things that Ratzinger points out is that um, regardless of, of where you end up kind of falling in regards a certain book about who the author or authors may have been, um, in each case, the author is still uh, the people of God, right? And that you have these people who are uh, collecting the wisdom and the the uh, the traditions that the people of God have received and are writing them down and the, the histories that they have heard and they're writing them down uh, on behalf of the people of God, right? And um, I think that something similar happens with the 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 way that prefiguration works, right? The New Testament speaks about Jesus as a second Adam or as the last Adam, right? And then we have the temple and we have the new temple and we have the, you know, David and now we have a new David, as it were. And um, we also kind of participate in this as well. So you have Mary, of course, right? And um, we can see how different women in the Old Testament, like Hannah or Eve, 
prefigured Mary, okay? But Mary is the image of the church. And each one of us is a member of that church, which is a living body. And so you, you have, as it were, this living body, which is, of course, a metaphor, but a living body that is moving through history. And uh, there is a continuity there. And so the action of God, we, can, we imagine grace, like the, the blood that is flowing through this body, um, that grace can, can kind of repeat itself, in, 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 as it were, in, in, um, as this body moves through history, this, the, the, as the church moves through history. And so the grace that, um, that Mary received, for example, when she said, let it be done according to, my, to your will, Lord, right? We can receive that grace in our own lives. When we come to a moment of decision in our lives, that's really difficult. And um, we receive that grace and we, reply, we respond to it like Mary did. Um, we, in a sense, are, um, there is a sense in which that action has been prefigured. And that's what the, the church fathers spoke about as the moral sense, right? Where you have the, the, these different senses, spiritual senses of scriptures. There's the allegorical or typological sense, the moral sense and the anagogical sense. And the way that these three differ is um, they all relate to the literal sense of scripture, which is the, the like the original meaning of, of, the, of the, the word of God. But they point in different directions. The arrows point in different directions. So typology, prefiguration points forward in history, right, to the fullness that Christ brings. Um, the moral sense, it, it, we can understand it as pointing to, to me, like to each one of us throughout, as we move through history. Um, and so when, when the word of God says something very special to me, um, that, that can be part of God's plan for the, the word of God, right? That could be a real meaning. Uh, and then the anagogical sense refers to the relationship with heaven. Um, but I, I guess I would see that as kind of this repetition of the grace flowing through us that um, can happen throughout history um, and God's plan being uh, repeating in us is how I would see it mainly. Beautiful. Um, thank you, Father, for, for that. Um, we have uh, Roger Pedroza asking, um, why was it so difficult for the Jews at, at the time to not believe uh, that Jesus was the Messiah? Why was it, you know, we, I guess I may re restate that as like, it's so mm -hmm. for us, we're like, yeah, <laughs> right? It's, that right. makes so much sense, but they're unable to see it. And why was it? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I think a lot of it is that the um, the expectations that they had, of course, were for a um, someone who would create a political kingdom that was like that of David and Solomon, but that would um, potentially be a kingdom that would rule the world. Um, and Jesus came in, and he wasn't simply moving things forward and like taking, as it were, a pie and making it bigger. Um, he was bringing a whole different genre of thing. Like that's this is the transcendence completion part of of uh, typology, where it's so much bigger than anyone ever expected. It's so much greater than anyone ever expected um, that it was hard to accept. Uh, it was hard to understand, and and that's a lot of times our um, our challenge as well, right? That the gospel oftentimes is not difficult to believe because it lacks evidence. Sometimes it's difficult to believe just because it's it's so overwhelmingly beautiful <laughs> that or that we it, we can be hard for us to believe that God loves us that much, right? Um, but that is the gift that God gives to us in, in Christ. Father Francisco asked, and I'm going to kind of reword how he he put it in the Q&A, but basically saying, you know, are only the Trinity and the sacraments prefigured or can we see evil prefigured as well in the Old Testament? Hmm. Um, yeah, so there are examples of uh, evil prefigurations, okay, um, as it were. We see, for example, Pharaoh and Egypt is used in the New Testament. Uh, we mentioned the, the idea of baptism, right? Where you have Pharaoh and he is prefiguring Satan, as it were, in baptism. Satan who is going to be destroyed by the waters of baptism. Or um, the uh, one could see the army maybe as prefiguring sin or something like that, right? So there are these elements, but they're always in relation to the fullness that Christ brings positively. So um, evil is something that is always a lack of a good. And in this case, it's um, 
it's something that helps us to appreciate, right, this good that God is giving us. Uh, it's not that evil itself becomes greater or something like that, or that has a fullness, um, but that evil kind of relates to elements that are in the fullness that, that, that Jesus brings. Uh, and this happens in the old and it happens in the new as well. Um, and we could see as well a sort of prefiguration of what, of what Jesus did on the cross as prefiguring as well um, what will happen in his second coming, where this defeat, this definitive defeat of evil uh, on the cross and, and in his resurrection will be brought to a further fullness, as it were, at the end of time when the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven. And maybe we'll get you out of here on this one, Father. Um, just you, you focused a lot about on the, the idea of, um, you know, priest and king. Of course, in baptism, we hear how we're baptized priest, prophet, and king. Can, but can you talk about why those titles matter in the first place when, when it comes to understanding what, what Jesus is doing? Sure, and I'd like to relate this to, I see one of the questions there was, um, what significance, if any, does royalty have it today, right? Um, and I think that what it, the way that it relates today would be, you know, one of the things that we see with, with the coming of Jesus is that these human institutions, like a human kingdom or like a human king, um, are, um, are sort of spiritualized. And I want to, I put that in between um, quotes because what I mean by that is that Jesus's kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. It's not something um, that uh, is as visible as the earthly kingdom of David. But I also put it in quotes because it has a real um, physical manifestation on earth, which is the church. And it is something that is actually universal, right? Even if the rulers of this world may not always recognize our Lord, right? So what we have now is this transcendent element of Jesus is our king, Jesus is our priest, and that priesthood is real and it acts through uh, priests like Father Hezekiah and myself, right, in, in confession or in the sacraments, but it's also always Jesus's priesthood. We simply participate in it, and when we uh, forgive sins, it's him who's doing that forgiveness, right, um, and something could be said that's similar to uh, the element of the bride, right, that um, this is also something that's very existential and personal. So then on a human level, um, like St. Paul speaks about how authority of uh, kings is in some way or rulers is in some way or another a participation, right? Jesus says to Pilate that you would have no power if God had not given you power. And the way that human rulers live that power throughout history can change, right? Um, and it in, in the case of today, normally it's sort of a democratic process, right? Where the people are, are offering, uh, are kind of delegating that power to a ruler who then makes decisions and so on. And, and the church teaches there that we, we do have a certain obligation to obey the authority, human authority, when uh, as long as what they ask is um, something that is not contrary to good morals or the faith. Because there's also a hierarchy going on here, right? We can have human rulers that do a service towards the common good, and we go along with that. Um, and they have a certain minimal participation in God's authority in that sense. Um, they also have a delegated authority from us in some way. But um, what they need, what they, um, they are, they are subordinate to God's authority, as all of us are. And so whatever they ask, if it is, um, it, not in accord with what God says, then we have uh, an obligation to follow what God says and not necessarily what the humans say. So it's a, it's kind of a yes and no question there, um, I would say. Thank you, Father. Excellent. We really enjoyed uh, your presentation today and look forward to following up with you and getting you uh, back here to the ICC very soon. Thank you. Thank you, Father Zakai. Thank you, Anna. If I may, I want to just answer one little question that remained open here briefly. Yeah. That is the question about the city of God of Augustine um, and whether the city that I mentioned and the church and all of that are related. And I, I would just, just like to say briefly that they're all the same thing. So the city, uh, the holy city in the book of Revelation, the, um, the city of God of Augustine, uh, the church, they, uh, they are all um, this kingdom that Christ came to inaugurate on earth. 
uh, and that we participate in, and that David as king, uh, his kingdom prefigured. Right? So the, the kingdom of David also prefigures this kingdom that has been inaugurated by Christ, which is the church, uh, and that we can also understand metaphorically as, as a city. Um, so, okay. thank you. Very cool. Well, Father Devin, would you mind closing us with your with a prayer and your blessing today? I'd be happy to, yeah. So in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for giving us your word. We give you thanks for your plan of salvation and um, for being our king, uh, for being uh, our spouse, for loving us in that way, for being for offering us the priest of your son, uh, who's also our king. We ask that you send down your blessing upon us today. Uh, open up our hearts to prepare our hearts, our lives for the coming of Christ. We ask that you give us the grace also to be ministers of your grace to others and channels of that grace to others. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus, our king. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.